Did you have a nice lunch? Good. I'm glad for you. We are studying in our fifth lesson on Revelation chapter 20. So let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. One thing about the book of the Revelation or the studying of the book of the Revelation, it will take you all over the whole Bible because it summarizes everything in the scriptures. And it will acquaint you with a lot of other writings. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 1. <clears throat> Therefore seeing we have this ministry. As we have received mercy. We faint not. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost." in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You will notice that the God of this world, although he is bound and cannot deceive the nations, he can still approach individuals after they receive the light of the gospel of Christ, and they believe not. Once the gospel is presented to an individual and they reject it, it says, then the God of this world will blind their minds. So Satan has liberties to involve himself in the destruction of mankind based on those individuals' relationship or lack thereof, with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation chapter 12. The book of the Revelation chapter 12. This will back up John chapter 12. Where Jesus said, now is the God of this world cast out. Let me get it back and read it like it should be read. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. We have almost an identical thing said in Revelation 12. And we'll begin reading with verse number 8. <clears throat> Of course not. Verse 7. And there was war in heaven, in the heavenly places, in the heavenly realm, with Michael and his angels. Michael and his angels. Let me get it right. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. This is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary and his warfare with Satan. And prevail not, the dragon and his angels prevail not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which sounds just like Revelation 20, verses 1 and 2, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven. What's the next word? Now. now. So that goes right along with the nows in John chapter 12. When did Satan get cast out? When the loud voice, the spiritual voice, the heavenly voice said, Now is come salvation. That's John 19.30. It is finished 
So when salvation came, that's when the devil was cast out. Now has come salvation and strength, and if you wondered when, the kingdom of God. That's when it was established on the cross when Jesus fulfilled his, his responsibility to God, and he said, it is finished. And the power of his Christ, now has come salvation, strength, the kingdom of God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuseth them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, they overcame him by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, that is, you spiritual people, those who are dwelling and seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Rejoice, you heavenly, born again, spiritual people, and ye that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because they are unregenerate, and the devil can walk about seeking whom he may devour, and he may devour anybody, as we already read, that rejects the gospel. He blinds the minds of them that believe not. So Revelation 12, 12 is an amazing verse to show you the difference between uh, the experience of the true believers, the heavenlies, and those who are unbelievers, those who are inhabitants of the earth, at the casting out of Satan. The inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. You can see that in Revelation 17, 5. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath. Why? Why? He knoweth he hath but a short time. And he must be loose for a little season. He knows, he knew at the cross when Jesus bound him up that he's now consigned to prison, but he's just going to have one more short time. And he shall go out uh, when the thousand years are expired, shall be loosed out of his prison. And uh, verse 3 of Revelation 20, he must be loosed for a little season. And there it is in Revelation 12, 12. He will only be loosed for a short time. Now, when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child, that is, the church. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, speaking of the working of the Holy Spirit, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place. He was cast out of his place. Verse number 8 of Revelation 12. And prevail not, neither was their place found any more in heaven, but the church has a place. Why? John 14, 1, I go to prepare a place for you. Where are you going? To the cross. So the church has a place, or 14, 2 actually, and the devil is cast out of his. Now, how long shall she be in her place? For the thousand years. Say it in a different way. Where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. How long is that? A thousand years. How long is that? The length of the church age. From the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. That he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman. Those who are earthly, they received the false gospel from Satan's ministers. And it's, they swallow up all of this. That's where denominationalism came from. 
and the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth. It's already happened in Genesis chapter 4. Your, blood, your brother's blood cries to me from the earth. You remember that? The earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And that made the devil mad. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. But, dear soul, that's one reason he's mad. They have the testimony of Christ. They keep his commandments. And remember, uh, back there in verse 11, that's how they overcame him. He knows that they've got what they need to overcome him. You ever uh, sang the song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God? Of course you have. What does it say? One little word shall fail him. Talking about Satan. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto de death. Revelation 12, 11. And it makes the devil mad, Revelation 12, 17, that they have these things because that by that he knows he can't get to them. Now, in that John 12, where we saw the nows, John 12, 31, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. If you will go back up to verse 23 of John 12, you will see that this was the hour and the time of the Son's glory. John 12, 23. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And he talks to the Father about this. And uh, he says in verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. And the Father said, I have already and I will again. You're such a faithful son. There's such perfection in you and such explicit obedience and absolute submission to my will that the time that you have lived on earth including your incarnation, becoming a man. And who can understand that? The invisible essence of the glory of Almighty God, who is spirit, becoming a man. Great is the mystery of godliness. What is that? God manifests in the flesh. I don't understand it. Anyhow, you've already glorified. I've already glorified it by you becoming man and by you being faithful in everything you've done. And I will glorify it again when you get to the cross. And then he says, that's when the prince of this world shall be cast out. But look at chapter 17. This is the hour of Christ's glory. John 12, 23. Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. John chapter 17, verse number 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. You need to cross-reference that with John 12, 23. It's the same thing because it's the same Jesus and it's the same Father and it's the same hour. So it's this hour that he will be glorified that he will recover everything that Adam lost. The devil tricked our forefathers. I don't mean three, four, five, four fathers. We didn't have four. He tricked our uh, parents and he stole the crown and the scepter from Adam. If you'll carefully read before uh, in, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, Adam had dominion over everything. He was king of the world. Satan wanted that. 
So he tricked him and got it away from him. Got him expelled from the garden. Then you hear Satan in Isaiah 14 saying, I will be like the Most High. He steps in and he wants to be the Messiah. He wants to be the revelation of God. But he's got absolutely nothing in him but hatred and murder and lies. God is pleased to let that go on for thousands of years until them that sat in darkness saw the great light of Jesus Christ coming and he being the light of life and the light of the world. And then Satan does everything he can with his gang, scribes and Pharisees, to destroy Christ. But Christ makes it all the way to the cross and he said, this is the hour of my glory. Judas came over to him and he said, Judas, take this biscuit and gravy and go whatever you do, do quickly. That him to whom I give the sop, do it, do it quickly. I want to get this thing done. And so when the cross was completed, Jesus cried, John 19, 30, it is finished. That's when the prince of this world, Satan, was cast out. That's when Satan lost his place. And that's when Christ made the place in the wilderness for the woman, the church. And she lives now in the wilderness. That is, in America, in Germany, in Spain, in France, in England, in the British Isles, in North Africa, wherever the gospel went, that's the wilderness. Where's the wilderness? Is anywhere the, the church has survived down through the ages since Pentecost. So that's what we have. Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. Verse 4. Well, let's read down to verse 4. As thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life, not to all flesh, but to as many as thou hast given him. You want to know what eternal life is? That they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And he says, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me with thine own self, with the glory that I had with thee before the world was. Let me come to you and glorify thine own self with us coming back together and the glory of God be seen greater than it's ever been. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. What is God's highest glory? Peace on earth and goodwill towards men. Shepherds were watching their flocks by night and the angel of the Lord appeared unto them, and the glory of God shone round about them. Why? Because Jesus is here. Isn't that good? Then in verse 24 of John 17, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Why? That they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. I want them to come to the place of being able to see the glory of God the Father and God the Son once again back together as sin has been handled. And we are now in a time of being brought back to the glory of Almighty God. Yet... All that's true. It don't change it. Yet, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, his cunning craftiness, 
So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Satan bound? Yep. The glory of God being seen? Yep. Yet, Satan is able to corrupt minds. Verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if, two words, a lot of the preachers that you are aware of should I finish that sentence? Are Satan's ministers. Isn't that good? What are they looking for? Verse 12, glory. That wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. Therefore it is no great thing if his, Satan's ministers, also, like him, be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. So those passages in John 12, 23, it's time for Christ's glory. John 17, it's time for God's glory and he wants to share it with you in the presence of the Father. Yet, Satan is working. 1 Timothy 4, and this is on the front page of the Jerusalem Gazette. This is today's news. Are you ready? 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, the Spirit, who is that? The Holy Spirit speaketh how? It means... He's telling the truth. He's pointedly telling the truth. That in the latter times, when Satan knows he has but a short time, some shall depart from the faith. How shall they depart from the faith? Giving heed to seducing spirits, seducing spirits and Doctrines of devils. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, hot iron, forgetting to marry. Man, I'm just going to tell you what Calvin said. He said that one of the, I don't know what you call them, monasteries or monasteries or whatever you call them, he said the fountains there were filled with the skulls of dead babies. Because the seducing spirit said, you priests can't marry. So they didn't marry. But they had illicit sexual relationships with nuns or mother superiors or whatever, whoever. And they didn't want anybody to know, so they killed the child and threw his body into the fountain. And commanding to abstain from meats. Now, you can't eat that on Friday. Stupid. How can anybody? Never mind. Listen, I was caught up in Baptist Romanism. I ain't got no rocks to throw at them other folks which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature is, of God is good, and nothing be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. But I still did not want to accept the invitation to go down there in Louisiana, and this is not Jimmy Downing, it's another fellow altogether, who every year their male members went out in the woods and shot everything they could find and drug it in there and cooked it and wanted me to come down there and preach it, uh, some sort of meeting and eat all that wild stuff. 
My granddaddy cooked a possum one time. It still looked like a rat. Okay. It can be refused. It's not to be refused. If, and I didn't have this, if it can be received with thanksgiving, I couldn't thank my Lord for no rat sitting there in a bed of sweet potatoes looking at me. Now, if you've eaten possum, that's fine with me. That's fine with me. But don't offer me any. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayers. But you see, seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, lies and hypocrisies, conscience seared with a hard, hard iron, getting off into all kind of crazy stuff. Second Timothy, chapter 3. Second Timothy. Sometimes it's harder to turn two pages in the Bible than it is 22. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Knowing this, that in the last days, dangerous, perilous times shall come. Here's America. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers. And didn't the devil accuse, accuse them day and night before the Lord? Yes. Incontinent, which means without any self-control. Fierce. Despisers of those that are good. Why? Because they hate the light. Traitors. Heady. High-minded. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. They're not going to turn loose their religion. But denying the power thereof, and God tells us from such turn away. Let me just point out some things. You don't need to turn back here. You can go back to chapter 16 of Revelation if you want to, and I'll be there in a minute. But in chapter 20... In verses 7 and 8, after Satan is loosed, he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, now listen, to gather them together. That's what he wants to do. He wants to put his spirit into all the nations. There will never be another one world government like Caesars, or Alexander the Great, or Nebuchadnezzar's, or Darius the Mede, or whoever else I'm leaving out. But there will be the ten kings representing the totality of human government who will give themselves to the beast for one hour, a short time. It even describes it as the seven beasts and the seventh is of the eighth. It's so different from, but it's exactly the same as the other governments that we have had, the Gentile world kingdoms. And if you want to know what will the world be like under the little season, just go back and study how the devil deceived and dealt through Caesar, Alexander the Great, Nebuchadnezzar, all them guys, and how the devil worked in the Gentile world kingdoms. And I listed them all out for you the other day, and I explained to you how that the seventh one, whose head was wounded, but he recovered from the womb, he's the seventh, but he's more like an eighth because he's not going to be one guy sitting on one throne in one nation ruling the whole world. It's going to be a variety of kingdoms all under the spirit of deception of the devil. Gog and Magog. You got it? Go back to 16.
Were we in 16? I don't know. No, we were in 12. I'm sorry. Revelation 16, verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. There's nothing better to make a highway with than a dried up riverbed. I hope I've got my history right, but you can't trust me anymore because sometimes my, my brain is like applesauce. But I think that's how the Persians brought down the Babylonian Empire was they came through a dried up riverbed and got in on them. Google it. Okay. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up. Why? In order that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. This is how he's going to get them all together. And I saw three unclean spirits. Now these, these guys bothered me for a long time. King James reads, And I saw three unclean, unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon. The Amplified reads, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs leaping out of the mouth. It's not that they were frogs, it's that they came out so forcefully. Frogs, the Hebrew word for frog in the Old Testament is translated marsh leaper. M-A-R-S-H dash L-E-A-P-E-R. A marsh leaper, something that jumps forth. That's what it's talking about. For the longest time, I tried to figure out how could unclean spirits be frogs. That's not the point. King James uh, italicized the word come, and that dulled my applesauce brain even further. But what it's talking about is how fast these spirits come out, not how much they look like frogs. Hope that helps you. It took me years to be able to figure that out. And you just got it in a matter of minutes. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs leaping out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false spirit. And they are the spirits of devils. The three unclean spirits are spirits of devils, not frogs, but spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole earth you read me the rest of it. To do what? To gather them. That's the same thing as Revelation 20, verse 7 and 8. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. He's going to leap out and go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, Hear the words again, to gather them. That's what you got in 16 and verse 14. And they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So he's going to finally try to have his one world kingdom. Been trying to have it ever since he got Adam thrown out of the garden. God just sat back and let him do what he wanted to do, but kept Israel holy. Then the Lord Jesus Christ came, put a chain around that boy's neck, <laughs> throwed him into prison and locked him up and sealed it up and said, okay, y'all can now go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation. And so Satan can go about seeking whom, whom the individuals whom he may devour. Satan can go about now blinding the minds of them which believe not the gospel. The individuals which hear the gospel don't believe it, but he can't deceive the nations anymore. But then God allows him to come forth. He comes leaping out like frogs and gets right at it. At it and gathers all the nations 
under the unholy spirit, sets himself up, tries to as ruler of the world, which is what he's wanted from the very beginning. I will be like the most high. If I tell you something, you can believe it. If anybody else says anything, it ain't true. I'm the one who rules this world. Be careful with that, folks. That's the devil. <clears throat> now, they leaping like frogs. Frogs are unclean, Leviticus 11.10. And they were everywhere in Egypt when God smote Egypt with frogs. They were in the bread trays where the ladies made up dough. They were in the bed chambers. You threw back the covers. Frogs was everywhere. You stepped on them trying to go to the bathroom. You couldn't walk nowhere without frogs everywhere. And it said when God removed the frogs, he didn't really remove them. He killed them all, and it stank in Egypt because there's dead frogs everywhere, and they just had to go sweeping up piles of dead frogs. That's how much the devil is going to permeate human society. Ain't you glad you're saved? Yeah. I'm glad you're saved. Hope you're glad I'm saved. So here they are. So we come to understand and see that the way they overcome is by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. Revelation 7, verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, which have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Isn't that good? They have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And that great tribulation is not the great tribulation. It is temptations taking you, which such are as common to man, and God being faithful in making sure that the temptation is mitigated to your ability to stand it. Now, let me read you a verse. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I don't care how much of a plucker Satan is, he can't unpluck you. I don't care how dark it gets, there'll be light in the chambers of Israel. It will get so dark in the world in Egypt that they can't get up and move out of their place. They can't see their hand in front of their face. But Israel had light in all of its dwellings. Isn't that good? Aren't you thankful for that? Amen. Revelation 2. Revelation 2 and verse 8. And unto the angel of the church of, in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. You look like you're poor, but you're rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer, Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation for a certain amount of time. It'll, I know when it'll begin, I know when it'll end. I'm Alpha and Omega. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Aren't you glad of that? Jesus said, be, be thankful that your name 
is written in the Lamb's book of life. This is basically what I had for you today. In that Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6, we went through that this morning. Verse 4 is the gospel reign. They're sitting on thrones. You can find that in Romans 5, 14 through 17. You can, you can see that in Revelation 5, 9, where the blood of the Lamb of God has kept them out of every nation and people and kindred. You can find them ruling and reigning in 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 5, saying, don't go hire you a lawyer if two of your brothers in the church get tangled up about anything. Take the least esteemed in the church and let them decide it because they will judge angels. The least, most poverty-stricken and least esteemed born-again child of God has got more sense than the whole what do you call that court up yonder? Supreme Court put together. So it's a gospel reign. Then in verse 5, we said those are the ones that are spiritually dead, the rest of the dead, those unregenerate. And then verse 6, it is a spiritual resurrection. And now is. You can find that in John chapter 5, verse 25. So we begin to see, dear soul, that this is nothing else than the unraveling of the administration of the new king of all the earth. Crown him with many crowns. Jesus Christ rules and reigns. I saw a bumper sticker the other day that said, Christ is ruling now. And I said, I sure am glad judging by the way you're driving. <laughs> but dear soul, this is just God telling us of his administration, his gospel administration and how he rules over the earth. It's not spooky and weird, and it's, it's not... Let me say it the other way around. It can be understood. Does any man lack wisdom? You know, how, you know what you do about that? Let him ask of God, who giveth to every man willingly. And he won't fuss at you for asking. There ain't no dumb questions. Talk to the Lord. It's your Lord. Do you want the blessings of this book? He that readeth and heareth and understandeth is a blessed man. No other book in the Bible is like that. I hope this has been a blessing to you. Somebody asked, how long are we going to be in the book of Revelation? And my answer was, I don't know. But I can tell you now, I still don't know. Will we be going back into this? I don't know. I don't even know if we're going to be able to meet anymore after this service. I don't know if I'll even make it home today. I don't care if I don't. If Jesus would come, that would be all right with me. I'd rather go to heaven than go to Tyrone. <laughs> Amen. Amen.